All right, I just ask, I, I would just like you to consider carefully the things I'm going to be to share this evening. Maybe it's not the way you have always um, seen or understood things, but all I ask is that, that we, we, we just think and have an open mind because one thing I've learned is that half of the, the reason, maybe more than half, maybe 80% maybe of the reason why there are so many divisions and contentions among Christians is because an open mind is a rare thing. It's a rare thing. It, 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 it grieves me many times to discover that It can be black and white, as clear as crystal in the Bible. People don't accept it unless it is what my group or my church or my background teaches me to believe. We want to hear what the Bible has to say as long as it agrees with my structure. And that is the reason why we, we as Christians, we have all these disagreements. You know, nobody has an open mind. It started back there with the scribes and Pharisees in the time of Jesus who they knew the truth so well, as I said last night. They knew the truth so well that they crucified the Son of God to defend their truth. And um, that may be the ultimate example of how religious prejudice works. So what I'm going to share this evening, I, I, I believe, is um, it, 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 it's something that, that should make every reasonable Christian think. And that's what I want you to do. I'm going to title the, the presentation this evening, The Legal Universe. The Legal Universe. And um, I want to begin by focusing on what the Bible says about the true nature of God. I'm just going to read two verses in this connection. And, and you can, you can find a dozen more, but I'm going to read the, the one that I consider to be most basic, most fundamental, one of the most important descriptions about the nature of God in the Bible. And it's found in 1 John 4 and verse 8. And it simply says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. I want you to notice that the verse does not say, God has love, or God is loving. This is not a description of this is not a description of the way God behaves. This is a description of the way God is, his nature. What this is saying fundamentally about God is that his, his very existence is focused on love. All right. Here's another one. This one, this one from, the book, from, the book of the, from the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. One of my long-time favorite verses. It says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. I have to admit that it was a long time before I could think of God in this way. I have to admit, even though I grew up in a, in a situation where I had a father who was a loving father, an understanding father. He was more than my father. He was my friend. I grew up with a father who, with all his faults, one thing I never doubted all my life. I never doubted how much my father loved me. He had faults, but so did I. And... If, you want to, 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 if I want to think of a picture of a good father, that was my father. He played with us. We rolled about on the bed. He had five sons before he had a daughter. We would jump on him and roll about and wrestle. Mama would be concerned about us pulling up the place. Daddy would kind of block her and let us escape. When she came charging into the room all upset. But, um, I mean... But I, I never, I couldn't think, I, I never thought of God in this way for many years because that's not how you think about God. God is a person who has, who is, going to, who, who is a judge. God is a person who 
is watching your behavior because if you do wrong, you are going to get it. That was my first concept of God. We, we were always told if you are good, you have a chance of making heaven. If you are bad, you won't make it. God was always the person who made the decisions where you ended up and it was based on your, your, your behavior. So we all try to be good enough. But we somehow never succeeded. Okay? And a lot of people leave religion because they have that concept in their mind and it, it just seems like something that doesn't work. You never are good enough. You, if, you, if you begin to think that you're accepted because of your behavior, you just are never good enough. Like I say, I'm learning so much from my grandson, okay? Well, uh, uh, he, started, he stayed a few nights with us. And then, that was a, maybe a year or so ago, he said he wanted to stay the night again. We said, okay, fine, we'd love to have him there. So he's staying, his parents leave him, and they go home a few miles away. About 10 o'clock, he says, I'm ready to go home to my family now. <laughs> he said, hey, you can't go home. You said you are going to stay. No, no, I, I, I was only staying for a time. I need to go home now. We are kind of upset. We said, your, your daddy and your mama went home long ago. It's a long drive to come back. It's 10 o'clock in the night. You, you, said, you just have to stay. He said, no, no, I want to go home. So he said, okay, we call his father. His father was a little upset. His father is coming. And, and I said to Kate, I said to him, if you go home, I'm not going to let you sleep here another night. Okay? So his father came. And his father came. He said, I'm not coming. Oh, no. <laughs> so everybody is mad now. And, and then his father says, what? You made me drive so far? He said, Grandpa said, if I go home, I can't stay with him again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was smitten. I said, no, no, no. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. He said, you're sorry? I said, yes. You apologize? Yes. You promise not to say it again? <laughs> <laughs> he put me through the ringer. And he taught me such a lesson because I'm thinking, do I want my grandson to believe that my acceptance of him is conditional? Do I want him to believe that if he's a good boy, grandpa will accept him, but if he's bad, I don't want him? Do I really want him to believe that? And, and I made a mental note, never, ever do something like this again. And it made me think. It made me think about God because I asked myself, am I a better grandfather than God is a father? We don't think of God in that way. We don't. Because we never grew up with this, this image of God. We never grew up with this concept of God. He's always so great and so almighty. These little things don't really come into the picture, right? And yet somehow I read somewhere that I was made in his image. That, that he designed me that I might be a pattern of him. Well, you know how we think, okay? He's so great and he's so almighty that he can't have feelings like me. And if he has some feelings, they are in some kind of, of uh, ethereal realm where they don't really matter much, okay? But, I, you know, I was thinking about this one day and I recognized something. You have three tiers of intelligence in the home. You have parents, maybe four tiers. You have parents, you have the, the, the older children, you have the babies, and you have the, the pets, all right? Somebody dies, the mother dies, or the father dies. And I ask myself, who will feel it the longest and understand it the best and feel it the hardest? I don't think it's the dogs. The babies will miss the parent for a few days, maybe, maybe a few weeks. The teenagers are going to feel the blow. They are going to feel it because they are at a stage where they can understand. But really, if my wife died, I don't think anybody would feel it as much as I feel it. In other words, the, the, the longer your association with a per person and the higher your level of intelligence, the greater your capacity to feel. Now, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it makes a lot of sense to me. So, God's greatness does not mean he is feeling less. I would suppose it means that he feels more than we feel. 
if we follow that pattern, okay, because that pattern makes sense to me, I would suggest that if we were made in the image of God, God feels things more than we feel things. So God feels love. God feels happiness. God feels warmth. God feels a desire for fellowship. This is the way God is. When I say God is my father, everything depends upon what father means to me. I know some people who have, who have had bad fathers and they can't relate to God that way. I know that experience, okay? I've met people who say this. And somehow they, their, their concept of fatherhood has to be adjusted before they can really relate to God in the right way. But I'll tell you, the more I understand that Jesus Christ is the face of God, the more comfortable I get with God. The Bible says we see the glory of God. We read it last night, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. We see the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. And when I look at Jesus Christ, what God is saying is, look at Jesus and then come and deal with me on that basis. You want to know how to deal with me? Look at Jesus and come to me on that basis because he is the express image of my person. We looked at him and we saw the glory of God. So God is saying, you can come lie on my bosom like John lay in his bosom. God is saying, look, if I were in, 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 in the physical circumstances, I would wash your feet, your dirty feet. I would wash your feet. Ha! Huh. First time I thought of that, man, I couldn't process it. I thought, man, you, you're verging, you verging and blasphemous now. But when I look at the Bible, God is saying to me, the best way you can understand me is when my son became a human being. That is me in living color. That is me in living color on the level that you can understand. This is the way I am. And I want you to approach me accordingly. That's a revolutionary concept for many people. And I hope that we're, 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 we're understanding and believing what I'm saying. Now, I want to contrast this with some disturbing ideas about God. First, disproportionate punishment. All right? Somebody tells a lie. And there are Christians who believe that for one lie, God is going to roast you forever. All right? I'm not hitting anybody's belief. I'm just speaking in a general way because I don't know what anyone believes. But I'm just saying, I'm, I'm asking us to think this evening. All right? There's a man in Jamaica that I know, right? I never, ever said more than hello to this man because I never wanted to be, be, be his friend. Because they told me that this man, he, had, he has like about eight daughters. One of them used to suck her finger and he would tell her not to. And one night, he took her finger and he burned it in the lamp. He put it in the lamp and he burned it until her finger was burnt. Every time I saw that man, monster came to my mind. Okay, I, I, and and I, I, I didn't want to have anything to do with him. We think of this and we say that man should be thrown in jail and the key should be dumped into the, into the middle of the ocean, right? But people say God does that. People say God does this. And I ask you, does your concept of God make sense? Does your religion really make logical sense? Because we just read that God is love. And like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. And we say, the father of love will take people, and because they made one mistake, they told a lie, or they stole something, even if it is only one time, he's going to roast you in a fire, not for 10 years, not for 20 years, but for all eternity. Good gracious me. And you are telling me that God is love? What you're asking me to do, you're, you're tearing my, my mind in two. You're telling me that I have to redefine love. Love really means some kind of monstrous emotion that, that I cannot grasp or understand. I'm trying to say to you that there are reasons why people believe this. There are reasons why this idea comes up. But... We're going to look at the foundational reason, but you, the, you, you have the idea of a God who apportions disproportionate punishment. I say disproportionate because if somebody tells a lie, give him a slap on the wrist, okay? If he, if he would even, even burn you for a minute, 
It would be hard. If you would even put your finger in the lump for a minute, it would be terrible. But it's your whole body for all eternity. I mean, Jonathan Edwards, I, I, some of us may know Jonathan Edwards. He was a, a famous preacher of more than 100 years ago. Jonathan Edwards was preaching, sinners in the hand of an angry God. He says, that God who holds you over the pit of hell like some loathsome spider abhors you. Your, your, your sins have offended him mightily. You are held there by just a, the strand of a thread. Look here, he scared people into, the, into religion. Hundreds of people professedly gave their lives to Christ. Dead, scared of God. I don't think that religion could have been worth much. But this, was, this, this, was, this, was, this is a popular understanding and idea. And when you think about this, I'm going to tell you something. If this is your concept of God, you are not going to think of God as your friend. And you might use the word father, but you are not going to think of him as your father. Not in any meaningful way. I mentioned eternal burning hell. The second point I want to, 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 to make is that many people think of the concept of what I call penal substitution. Now, you might not know what this means, but I'm going to explain it. Penal substitution is that somebody pays the penalty for what you did. There's no system of human justice that will allow this. Okay, if Brother Howard does something, and I come and say, I, I, I'll spend time in jail for him. Nobody's going to allow this. No, law, no legal system will allow that. Because it's, it's a person who committed the crime who needs to be punished according to, even, according to even the concept of justice. That's what needs to happen. But Christendom has, has a concept, deeply rooted concept, that you sin and God punishes somebody else for it. And that's the way we get to escape. Now, I know that we all teach and we all believe that Jesus died for our sins, and I believe this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to attack that fundamental great truth. What I'm trying to suggest is that our understanding of why it happened, our understanding of why it happened, the reason why it happened is faulty. Our understanding, the popular understanding, the, the understanding that pervades Christendom is the idea of penal substitution. It's a penalty. Who made the penalty? The law did. Who made the law? God did. So who demands the penalty. God does. You have a God who says, look, my grandson came to my home and he said, I want to go home. When he told me he was going to stay and I said, the only way I can overlook this, somebody has to be punished. I can't just say, forget about it. Somebody has to be punished because of the mistake you, my grandson, made. And that makes absolutely no sense to me. But this is what, this is a fundamental perspective of Christendom. We sin. And God says, I cannot just forgive you. Somebody has to die. And in order for you to not die, I have to put somebody to death. I have to see to it that somebody dies. And that person has to be my son. It's called penal substitution. And I've listened to the explanations. I've read the books. And to be honest, I've never seen an explanation that made sense to me. Maybe I'm just too, maybe, maybe I'm one of those persons, like some people say, look, you're just to believe things and nobody asks too much. You're too inquisitive. But I believe that we ought to have an intelligent reason for our religion. And it, especially if the Lord has it in his word, we should explore it and we should search it out. It's not good enough to say it is so because I was told it is so. It's not good enough. Especially when it, it, it paints such an ugly picture of the face of God. The fourth thing. The fourth thing I want to focus on is the concept of blood sacrifice. And that is tied to the idea of penal substitution. Blood sacrifice. God could not save humanity unless blood was shed. 
And it's in its in its barest form, this is what Christianity teaches. Blood had to be shed. Why blood? Well, of course, blood means life. But why do you have to die? Why does somebody have to die just because he made a mistake? Seen from this perspective, it just, it just boggles the mind. I mean, I don't know if somebody has a better answer than me, but the answer that I have is that it doesn't make sense. Okay? And um, I'm going to show you why these ideas have developed. Notice what I have on the board. And I know we're having a little movement, but I don't want you to miss this point because it is fundamental to what I'm trying to say this evening. Legalism is the reason. Okay, that is my conclusion. Having studied this subject, the reason for these wrong ideas about God is legalism. So I'm going to ask the question, what is legalism? Well, I have about four statements I'm going to put on the board that I want you to consider because sometimes people have just one idea of what legalism is. First of all, legalism has to do with legal law. Legalism is not necessarily a bad word. All right? It's in a certain context that it becomes a bad word. Legalism is that I'm in America. I make sure I drive at a certain speed. I'm a legalist when I'm here. I don't want the police coming and ask me any questions. So I'm a legalist. I stick by the law in every detail as much as I understand the law. I'm a legalist. In other words, my life when I'm here is run by legal law. Things I would do in Jamaica... I don't do here because I'm under this legal system while I'm here. So I'm a legalist. As a matter of fact, I could put it to you that a good Christian in the secular world should be a legalist. Human society is run by legal rules. There's no other way that man can think of to control men other than by legal rules. Even the church, they've established a legal system. A system whereby you are disfellowshipped if you don't conform to certain things, or you are put to sit at the back, or you are censored, you're not allowed to speak. Everything in human society, whether it's a youth club or a, or a banking system or something, whatever, it's run by legal or legal system. Why? Because the only way humanity knows to bring order and discipline is rules, legal rules. And just in passing, anytime you have legal rules, you also have legal penalties. If you have a legal system and you don't have any penalties, the system won't work. You can imagine they have speed limits on the road and there are no cops and there are no speed, speed cameras and there's no penalty if you break the speed limit. How many people do you think would drive at 70 on the highways? Maybe the little old ladies, right? <laughs> Everybody else would be doing their own thing. So, so you have penalties because that's the nature of a legal system. You must have penalties. Legalism, first of all, has to do with legal law. It has to do with control by a system of legal law. Secondly, in the religious context, this is where legalism is bad. Or it is considered to be bad by those who are knowledgeable. Legalism is interacting with God through legal law. All right, I'm going to repeat that. It is having a relationship with God on the basis of legal law. And just to highlight what that means. It's like I say to my grandson, Cade, if you ever come here and raise your voice again, you're not going to be allowed to come back here. Or if you come and scatter your toys around the house, I'm not going to allow you to come back here. Or if you come back here another night and then decide to go home, you're not to come back here. It's my relationship with my grandson being defined by a set of rules. That's what legalism is. And it's the idea that my relationship with God is defined by a set of rules. The, the way I respond to those rules depends upon whether I'm accepted or I'm rejected. In the religious context, this is legalism. And it has to do with number three. It's, it's the idea of salvation by obedience to the legal rule. Number four, the fourth definition or the fourth understanding of legalism is that it is an extreme focus on legal details. It's like I, 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 I say to Sister Cornelia, Sister Cornelia, 
I'm so hungry, I haven't eaten for two days. Can I have a slice of bread? And you know what she does? She gives me one slice of bread. She gives me exactly what I ask for, nothing more, because this is the way the legal mindset works. It is meticulous about exactly what is stated. It's like I heard about the Jews. I, I mean, I, I'm giving you secondhand, a secondhand experience is what I heard from reliable sources. They said that the Orthodox Jews, they will not turn on the, the light on a Sabbath because the Bible forbids kindling a fire. And the light switch, when you flip it, it makes a little spark on the inside. So they will not flip the light switch. If they have somebody working for them, that person will turn the light on and turn it off. The Jew will not do it. That is an extreme case of legalism. But, but I mean, I heard a story in Romania. For the Romanians who are here, it, it's interesting. Because what this happened in the Romanian Reformed Adventist Church. They, 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 they baptized the man. And um, he, became, he came to church. And before they had time to receive him into fellowship, <clears throat> he went back out into the world. And he, he stopped coming to church. And he started to live in such a way they decided they had to disfellowship him. But then they realized he had never been received into fellowship. So they had a problem. They didn't know how to disfellowship him when he had never been received into fellowship. So they went and asked the man if he would come to church to be received into fellowship so they could disfellowship him. And the man refused to cooperate. And they pursued the man for about a year until finally to get rid of them. He agreed to come. They received him into fellowship and then disfellowshipped him. Now this is the way of legalism. It is mindless. It obeys the rule because the rule says so. It does not consider the meaning or the spirit or the intention behind the rule. And I like to use an example all the time that it, it's, it's good all the time. The sign at the door says, please wipe your feet. Okay? It's raining outside. It's muddy. Everything is dirty. <clears throat> I come to the door. <clears throat> I wipe my foot one time, maybe twice, and I step inside and you see the mud tracked across the floor. Brother Howard comes to the door and he takes off his shoes and he steps inside. Now, who obeyed the rule? I obeyed the rule. Who kept the purpose or the spirit of the rule? Brother Howard, but he didn't obey the rule. Okay, so legalism looks at the word itself and obeys the word without understanding or without any idea of the intention of the person who made the rule. The person who has understanding, he understands the mind of the person who made the rule. He understands what that person is after and he fulfills the spirit of the rule rather than maybe the letter of the rule. Now, legalism is an extreme focus on legal details. And usually it is without understanding of the principles behind the rule. Now, I have these four concepts of, legal, of legalism and maybe there are more. These are the four that I want to focus on. And of course, it leads always to a belief in what I call a nitpicking God. All right? I'm not going to trouble anybody. I was thinking of an example. Maybe I should. Or maybe I should be sensitive. I shouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I think it is wise if I don't. But look, look, look at, let's look at ourselves. And, look about, and think about the things that we do in our religion and the reasons why we do them. And ask yourself, do these make, do these make sense? All right, I, I'm going to take the, 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 the issue of kneeling in prayer. All right? I usually try to kneel in prayer when I am praying. At one time, I believed that everybody must kneel when you are praying. But... Then I started to think about my father and that God is my father and the relationship we have. And I'm thinking, so when I'm in the bathroom, I can't pray. Or a lady who has to cover her head when she's in the bathroom, she can't pray. So I start to ask myself questions about things like this. And I start to think, why do we do the things that we do? I kneel in public because I want you all to know that I respect God. Not because I think that God doesn't hear me. Because I, I pray lying on my bed. 
I lie with my hands behind my head looking at the stars sometimes. I talk to God any way and anywhere I am. He's my daddy. But I, 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 I kneel in public because I want you to know that I respect him. And I don't want you to think that he's somebody to be treated with disregard. So there's a reason why you do things, right? But it's not a mindless reason. So, legalism by nature believes in a nitpicking God, in a God who focuses on minor details without reason. The rule is there, and so it's like the guy in, in, in Poland who said he's going to start walking with the paddle at his side. Now that I told him that, you know, he said yes. He, for him, the reason why God said it is not important. The reason is that it is said. That person may have the best of intentions, but he does not know God. And his relationship with God will be the relationship of a servant. Now, <clears throat> just in passing, I have two people in my home, right? One of them is my son and one is my servant. I say to my son, Daniel, take out the garbage. He says, Daddy, I think to take it out later would be better because mommy still has some work to be done and she has some stuff to throw in the garbage. I say to my servant, Tony, take out the garbage. What must he do? He takes the garbage out. He doesn't have the right to argue. Because he, it's not the place of a servant to question what the master is doing. A son is different. A son is a part of the family. The son is in the home. Why? Because he's family. He's not there getting a salary. He's not there because he obeys the rules. If a servant starts giving you a back shot, he's gone. Oh, that's, you don't say that here? It's Jamaican. <laughs> back chat, he starts to argue back at you. He's gone. <clears throat> so, there's a difference between the identity and how you behave accordingly. The servant, he obeys the rules in a legal way. And his, he must be nitpicking in how he re responds to the rules because he's a servant. He's there based on his performance, so his performance better be good. The son is there because he belongs, his family. And he has a right to talk and discuss things, and he also understands better what his parents are doing. These are human illustrations, but they are real illustrations because it is God himself who uses the, the terminology of father when dealing with us. It is he himself who says his life is in us. It is he himself who says, like as a father pitieth his children. It is his son who told me to call him father and says he has put his spirit in my heart that I can say what? Abba, daddy. So I have every right to relate to God, not in a disrespectful way, but in a familiar way. I want to be more and more familiar with him. I want to know him to the nth degree. I want him and me to be able to wrap up together and feel his warmth and to hear him saying, my son, I love you. That's the kind of father I believe he is. Now, I'm saying that legalism is what has led to these wrong ideas. And I'm going to just ask you to look at the legal framework. It begins with the idea that the central object is the legal law. What do I mean? In the universe, what God is defending and what is at the center is the legal law. It's the idea that the universe is a legal place and God operates on the basis of legal rules. All right, I want you to consider that because that is fundamental to many Christian religions, to many Christian beliefs, that it's all about legality. And I don't mean Seventh-day Adventists who focus on ten rules. I mean most denominations, they might not focus on the Ten Commandments, but they focus on legal rules as a means of pleasing God. It's not just Seventh-day Adventists and Sabbath keepers. It's almost every denomination. They just have different sets of rules. But they are all believing that, well, most of them, as those that I know, they believe that their relationship with God is defined by their behavior. How well they conform to certain kinds of behavior. That's what defines their relationship with God. So, law, legal law, becomes the basis of my relationship with God, and legal law becomes a central object, okay? You always have your eyes on the rules and on the law. It's more about the law than about the God. 
Adam's problem, they believe, was that Adam broke a legal rule. And when you break a legal rule, what must follow? Penalty. I'm going to explore that a little bit more because I wanted to see that. I wanted to see how, many, how much sense it makes or how little sense it makes, that concept. Now, Adam did break a law. But if you believe it was about the law, I don't think you understand what happened. I find it interesting that the Bible says that in the evening, God came to visit Adam and Eve just the way he always did. God didn't change. Did he change his behavior? He's back there in the evening. Every day it's the same thing. And he comes there in the evening. And what has happened? They're hiding. Who has changed? Not God. It's Adam and Eve. God made a rule. But I think if we look at the rule and think the rule is the issue, we miss the point. Okay? I, 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 I would put this to you. Adam and Eve. Eve is there. Let's say Eve because she's the one who was first. Who was first in transgression. Eve comes to the tree and she listens to the serpent and she's a, she says, yeah, that makes sense. And she reaches out her hand to pluck the fruit, right? And at that moment, God appears. She pulls back her hand. Okay? She doesn't take the fruit. Is there a problem? There is a problem. Has she transgressed? Yes. All right. But she has not actually broken the legal rule because the legal rule has to do with your behavior. And even if she never reached her hand, but she intended to. But what has happened has happened in the mind of Eve. There is a problem in her mind that has to be fixed. Whether she took the fruit or not, humanity has a problem that God has to deal with. And what is that problem? She has stopped trusting God. She no longer sees God as a trustworthy father that she can have a warm relationship with. Even when she goes into his presence, she's thinking, I don't trust him because the devil has already gotten her to agree to that idea that God is not trustworthy. So if, if she lives for a hundred years and she never ever takes that fruit, there's a problem walking in the garden. And one day it's going to burst out. Because if you don't trust God, there is rebellion waiting to show its face. So, the problem was not so much the breaking of the legal law. The greater problem and the true problem was that Adam and Eve chose to separate themselves from God. That's the problem. Now, if you look at the situation in this way, you have a completely different picture. God said, if you eat, you will die. Popular Christianity says God was threatening Adam and Eve. If you eat, I'm going to kill you. Was that how it was? Like I said to my son, look here. I put down my mango here. Any of you touch it, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> my goodness. But if I put a fruit there, that somehow has the ability to kill you. If the fruit itself is connected to some kind of device that will explode if you take it. And I say, don't touch it. If you touch it, you will die. It's a completely different scenario, isn't it? I'm not threatening you. I'm trying to preserve you. This fruit would have given them the opportunity to choose Satan and to reject God. God didn't want that. God was trying to warn them, if you do this, something will happen. You will die. It's not legal law. It's the law of consequence, which is a law of nature. The problem with Adam and Eve was that they set a chain of circumstances into place that eventually would result in their destruction and the destruction of their entire race. It's not a legal thing where God says, I'm going to make a rule, and if you break the rule, I'm going to punish you. In fact, I'm going to kill you. Law and punishment. Or is it law and consequence? Is it legal law with punishment? Or is it natural law with consequence? Those are the two roads. And the majority of the Christian world takes the legal road. They see the universe as a legal universe with God as a great judge. And God as a great lawmaker. The maker of legal law. And once you take that road, everything follows. As I'm going to demonstrate. So man's great purpose in life becomes to keep the legal law. 
And salvation ultimately is for those who keep the law. You can't get away from it. You're following a natural course. You're following a logical progression. Okay? Once you start at that place, you must continue on that road. And I could give you a dozen more things, but I'm just going to try to keep it conservative. What is man's problem? In this scenario, your problem is that you are guilty. And what is guilt? Guilt is a mental state arising from law-breaking. You have two parts to guilt, all right? Benjamin disobeys his father. His father tells him, I wanted to reap the tomatoes today. Instead, he goes to play football. So, when his father comes home in the evening, he's trying to avoid his father. Now, Benjamin is guilty. He's guilty because he disobeyed the rule. And that guilt has two sides to it. Number one is what happens in Benjamin's mind. But number two is what happens in his father's system of administration. Guilt from his father's side is a legal status. He broke my rule and I must do something to deal with what happened. He's guilty. And how am I going to deal with it? There has to be some form of punishment. And in Benjamin's mind, I broke the rule. I'm not worthy. I'm only a, a, a worthless person. And I'm going to keep out of my father's way. And I'm going to try to be better. He has feelings of guilt and low self-esteem and low self-worth because he broke the rule. So guilt on his part res results in him feeling like a second-class citizen. And on his father's side, it results in righteous indignation. And a desire to fix it so that he doesn't do it anymore. So, that's what guilt is primarily. It's a state where you become worthy of punishment. Guilt becomes the problem that needs solving. Now look at what God, uh, how, how we see. We see man took the fruit. Man took God's fruit. Man becomes feeling like he's guilty. And God says... God says, you broke my law. I can't let it pass like this. I'm going to have to deal with you. For some reason, I have to deal with you. Why? Because my law must be defended. I can't allow you to treat my law with impunity. All right? I'm going to, we're going to look at that a little more closely. But the problem that needs solving now is man's guilt. And of course, Christians believe that God solved the problem by killing his son. Which is difficult to understand. God settles guilt... By punishing one in the place of others. It's like, um, it's like Abraham says, Benjamin, I've decided how to deal with this. Uriah, I'm going to spank you. I mean, when they were younger, when they were smaller, right? <laughs> he says, Uriah, I'm going to spank you. And Uriah is thinking, what on earth did I do? And even Benjamin, who says, I'm glad I'm not getting a beating, but he's wondering, there's something kind of strange about the system. Because Uriah did nothing. Why? How does it satisfy anything to beat Uriah for what I did? And, and, and I know even Christians ask that question. They say they don't understand, but they think God designed it so it must be all right. So you think God has some strange justice system that we're incapable of understanding. And it has to be so. It's a strange justice system because God declares in the Bible over and over that he does not punish the innocent for the sins of the guilty. But he would say, in my case, I've made an exception. All right? Now, I want to look at guilt and justice a little bit more closely. Guilt is a mental state induced by legalism. As I said, I'm going, this is an expansion of what I said earlier on. It's a state of your mind, and it's induced by legalism. In other words, Benjamin did not reap the tomatoes. But his father never told him to do it. Does he feel guilty? What makes him feel guilty? It's the rule that his father gave, right? Because his father said, reap the tomatoes. And he didn't. Now the rule makes him feel guilty. So guilt is related to law. Guilt is related to legal law. I mean, sometimes he might feel, okay, the tomatoes need reaping and I should have reaped them. And so he feels a little twang of guilt, but he doesn't feel any real strong guilt because he never got a command to do it. So guilt 
is created in a legal system. Outside of the legal system, it's fine. I'm driving on the road 200 miles per hour, and there's no rule. I'm fine. I was in Europe, and I did 220 kilometers per hour. I, did, I wasn't driving, but I was on the autobahn, and there's no speed limit. My driver did 220, and I, well, I was 90% comfortable because the road is fine. But um, <laughs> 220, you think, man, if you hit a little something, it's going to be a little messy. But I didn't feel guilty. And my driver didn't feel guilty because there's no speed limit. But um, I know that when you are, like in Australia, it's $700 if you overtake on the white line. No, if you overtake on the white line, you lose your license. It's $700 if you're caught speeding. Everybody drove like snails, right? And um, you, 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 you. You feel guilty if you have broken a legal rule. If it's not there, you might be careful, but you don't feel guilty if you, tr if, you, if you do something that would normally be illegal because the law isn't there. So what I'm saying is that guilt is related to legal law. So if there's no legal law, there could not be guilt. Guilt is removed by God's acceptance. You know, it's like my poor little grandson was feeling guilty because his grandpa says, you can't come back here. If you go home tonight. And when I said, I'm sorry. He wanted to be sure because he wanted his conscience and his mind to be free. He said, you're sorry? You, you, you promise not to say it again? You apologize? He made sure he got everything. And then, he's okay. He no longer feels any way about going home, right? Because the law that I made, I took it out of the way. I got rid of it as fast as I could. And um, so... If God would accept you, then your, your, your guilt problem would be over, okay? But the, the teaching is that God only accepts you if he, first of all, kills his son in your place. Then he will accept you. Christians believe that guilt is taken away, but they believe it is by process of blood sacrifice. It is process of penal substitution. But I'm going to put it to you this evening that, that God settles guilt... Where the guilt problem is concerned, he does it by eliminating legalism. If you can get rid of legalism, you'll, you'll be rid of guilt. Now, I said to you this morning that you should go to the book of Hebrews and look at, in fact, the New Testament. And look, at the, 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 look for the statement. You can do it easily on your phone or any of these modern devices. Look for the statement about clean conscience. Look at the, 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 just look for those two words, clean conscience. You will be amazed how many times the Apostle Paul uses the word clean conscience. He says, what God has given us is a clean conscience. Now, how can you have a clean conscience if you are still continuing to do the things that are wrong? Well, when I was ignorant, I decided that this must be because I never ever do anything wrong. Because when I was thinking this way, I was thinking... I have a clean conscience because my performance is perfect. You know how many times I ever accomplished that? Zero. You know how many times I've had a clean conscience consequently? Zero. You know how many times I ever felt fully accepted by God? Zero. Because I never ever made it where my conscience was 100% clean. It was worse because I was listening to, to legalists and somebody said, you must be careful about the way you eat. If you lick your fingers between meals, it's a sin. <laughs> oh, goodness me. Somebody said it. I'm not making it up. Be because the way of legalism is that if you are going to please God by your performance, then you please him better by more meticulous performance. All right? You'll find legalists who are adding rules, adding rules because it become, they're looking for more ways to please God by their behavior. So some people tell you, your shirt must be of a certain color or, or this must be a certain way. They, they make rules, they add rules because their idea is that the more rules there are, the better you can please God. But in reality, what ends up happening is that you never ever feel accepted because your acceptance depends on your performance and your performance is never 100%. You never ever are secure in your relationship to God and in the thought of your salvation. You cannot be. God settles guilt by eliminating legalism. 
You know what God did, and I'm going to say it, and I hope this is a place where we can understand. God has not eliminated the law, the Ten Commandments. God has not eliminated the Ten Commandments as a pattern of the way he would like us to behave. But God has eliminated the Ten Commandments. God has eliminated the law as the basis for our relationship. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's like, I don't want my grandson to say, I'm going home when he comes here. I don't want him to get me up at 10 o'clock and say, I want to go home. I don't want him to do that. But I will never make that, I will never say, if you do that, you are not my grandson. I will never do that. What I want of him is different from what I, the basis on which I accept him. What God did for us, brothers and sisters, he accepted us, what does the Bible say? In the beloved. You know where that verse is? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 is it, or verse 6. He has made us accepted in the beloved. Why does God accept me? Jesus Christ. Not my behavior, not my performance. It has nothing to do with my behavior. I am accepted in the beloved. What God has done, he has found a way to bypass my behavior, to save me without my behavior. Hallelujah. Because if it had to do with my behavior, maybe Abraham would be saved and I would be lost, right? Because he's so much more disciplined maybe, right? So if, if, if it was my behavior, the disciplined would live. And the weak people would die. But God bypassed my behavior. Okay, I'm not going to behave like a dog. No, I love my father and I love his ways. And so I'm going to live how he wants me to live. But if I happen to slip, I'm not going to worry about him. You know why I am, one, I, 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 I am accepted? It's not because I got a job and I'm being paid for the job. And my, my status depends on my performance. No! I'm accepted because I am family. Benjamin doesn't pick, pick the tomatoes. You think Abraham is going to kick him out? If he was a servant, he's out the next day, right? Or maybe Abraham would show a little mercy. But, and give him another chance. But he'll give Benjamin and Uriah chance after chance after chance. He will try to make them learn to do the right thing. But they're not accepted because of their behavior. They're accepted because they are family. They are one life. His blood is in them. And that's the reason why they belong in the home. And that's why I belong in God's family. Hallelujah. Amen. God bypassed my works and found a way to save me outside of myself. And this is the way he got rid of legalism. He made me know your acceptance does not depend upon your performance. It is not about your, your relationship to the law. Yes, the law is good. And yes, if you walk in harmony with the law, it pleases me. But it is not the way you are accepted. Will God eternally destroy the wicked? Yes. But there are two reasons why you do something. All right? I've, I kill wasps. <laughs> I kill mosquitoes. Okay, but when I... When, in my earlier life, in my first life, when a mosquito bit me and I caught him, I would pull off his legs one at a time. <laughs> and I would set him on the ground without his wings and his legs and leave him there. Because he bit me. Okay? Is this the mind of God? Because when you have to get rid of something especially another human being. You do it as quickly as you can with tears in your eyes. You do it because you have to. But man, to roast a person for any time or for eternity. And yet, Christians say it is justified. Why? Because it is the law. The law has been offended and the law is of such a great holy thing that even God must bow to the law and God must burn you forever because you broke his law. Now, this is the strangest thing because punishment has two different perspectives. You have punishment that is punitive and you have punishment that is corrective. Do you know the difference? I, I, I punished my children. 
But the reason why I punished them every time was because I wanted them to be better. I was trying to make them better. Is that right, parents? If you are good parents, that's why you punish your children, right? And so you don't overdo it. And you are looking for some result out of it. You, you punish them with pain. You are feeling the pain more than them. But you have to do it because you want them to become a better person. But you have another kind of punishment which is based on vengeance. Revenge. Satisfying my feelings. Of, 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 of I have been offended and you are going to suffer just as I suffered. You, if, you, if you ever look at some of these court scenes. I've seen them and sometimes I'm amazed. As a Christian, I'm amazed. I see somebody who has done some, mur some crime, maybe murdered somebody, and I see the family come in the court and they're allowed to say something and they say, we hope you rot in hell. We hope so and so and so. They say the most vile things to this criminal. Because for them, the punishment is punitive. I'm going to make you suffer because I suffered. It doesn't correct anything. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't make the person a better person. But I want you to rot in hell because you made me suffer. Now, is God like this? God chastises whom he loves, but he does not chastise them to make them suffer needlessly. And yet, the concept of hell, the concept of that long-term punishment, and, and similar concepts. Some don't believe in an eternal hell, but they believe in God punishing somebody in a kind of vengeful way. This concept gives God a face, again, that makes you think, this is a person I need to be clear of, because if a, if a human being behaved in that way, you'd want to avoid him. You'd be scared of doing anything to, 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 to offend him, because you know his vengeance is long, and he has a long memory, and he's going to get you sometime, and you are going to get it. But eternal destruction really exists. But eternal destruction, what the Bible says is the wages of sin is death. Eternal destruction. And I'm not denying that the Bible says that it is fire that is going to purify this earth and that fire will destroy the wicked. That's not in question. But the question is, does God deliberately prolong the suffering of those who have to die? Who does that satisfy? Who does that help? Who? God? Who? Something named the law? I mean, the law has it over God that God must submit to the law and make you suffer on and on and on because the rule says so. No. But it's based upon the legal perspective. A legal rule demands legal penalty. And so these ideas developed because the Christian world was locked into the legal paradigm. They were locked into the legal paradigm and they followed their ideas through to the logical conclusion until you have this kind of situation today where God is almost a monster in terms of how people perceive him. Fire is a means of, it's not punitive, it's purgative. That's what the punishment is about. And disturbing consequential beliefs that arise is that God punishes for law breaking, and I mean punitive punishment. Final punishment by sustained burning, we went through this, not corrective, but punitive. But here's another perspective. We almost covered everything. I told you I wouldn't be too long. Adam and Eve broke natural law. The key ingredient was that they lost the life of God. Jesus came to restore that life of God to the human race. What does he say in John 10 and verse 10? I have come that what? They might have life and have it more abundantly. But in order for you to have life, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, that in Jesus Christ, you died to sin. Jesus could not defeat sin unless he died he had to die in order to defeat sin. He had to take sin and he had to put it to death on the cross. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve placed themselves in a position where they were, they, they, they were cut off from God. And they should have been cut off forever because that's what they chose. They, they chose their part with Satan. That's what they really chose. God had to find a way to bring them back to himself without doing it himself. And I, I tried to go through this last night. I tried to go through this last night, but I know some of us weren't here last night. Okay? But just, just to quickly rehearse. Satan split the universe into two. Bang! A line through the middle. Not a physical division. It was an ideological division. Over on this side, you have God. God's principles. And over where God is, what do you have? You have life. Over here, it is good. 
Satan takes another half of the universe and he says, here is a better way of life. He didn't, he didn't say, here are murderers and thieves and criminals. He says, I have something better than what God has to give you. That's why he deceived so many of the angels. He presented something better than what God had. That's, what he, that's how he presented it. So he has this side of the universe. And over here is evil because the spirit of God is not here. But nobody knows. It's not immediately apparent. And he deceives Adam and Eve into taking this side. And so they step from, God created them on this side. And they step across onto the evil side. Now it seems simple. All they have to do is to step back across. As soon as they find out the disaster that is here, come back across. But it can't work that way because they have, they have eliminated the spirit of God from their lives. They have chosen Satan's principles. And Satan's principle is this. You are better off without God. You can be God in your own right without God. That's what he said. You shall be as gods. You become God in your own right if you, if you turn away from God. So, now you're over here. Can you go back? No, because without the Spirit of God, you cannot choose God. How can you choose God without God? The carnal mind is what? Enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God and it cannot be. The nature of that mind was seen that day when God came visiting Adam and Eve and he found them running in terror to hide. That's the nature of the carnal mind. So they are over here and they are lost. But God says, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to introduce something into the human life stream that will take humanity back to myself. What God did was so amazing. When I understand it, I, like, I, I use this term a lot, but I can't think of something better. It blows my mind, <laughs> right? My, my, my brain is like it's close to exploding. You know what God did? No man can be separated from God and choose God. Nobody can do it. Only God can be separated from God and still choose what is good. And when I say God, I mean the Son of God. The only begotten Son of God. So, what God did was he, he made his son join the human race, right? God joined the human race. Oh my God, don't you know that it is true? Of all the worlds and the beings in the universe, God joined the human race forever through his son. God and I are family. His son has my blood in his veins, the same blood, the same genetics. Jesus took it on himself. He became one of us. And so he was born, and God put him here where Adam and Eve belonged. And he took his spirit from him on the cross. He took away his spirit from Jesus Christ. And when you take away the spirit of God from somebody, what happens? They die. They become evil, and they die. That is what killed Jesus. He had to die, because God had to take his spirit from him in order for him to stand where man should have stood. So it wasn't like blood sacrifice, like God says, I'm going to stab you. I'm going to kill you in revenge for him taking my fruit. It wasn't legal. It's the natural consequence of the transfer of life from one to the other. In order to take our place as a human being, he had to be a human being because you can't save humanity if you are not a human. To take our place, he had to take that place of separation from God and it killed him. He had to die. It's the only way that he could save humanity. So, in spite of the fact that he was over here, God took away his spirit from him. Jesus remained good. He made the right choice and he stuck with it. He decided to die to sin and to take man's place completely and still remain loyal to God. And he was able to do it because inside of him, he was the son of God. He was good in himself. So take the spirit of God from him. He's still good because it is what he is by nature. It's the law of nature that a son inherits the nature of his father. So anyway, this is the key ingredient, the life of God. Humanity's problem was separation from life. And the eternal rule is that we receive life through union with God. That's what the whole thing is about. It's about, it's about the progression of natural law. Natural law, okay? Man is united to God, an act of nature. Man says, we don't want God. They step over here, disconnected from God. God wants to reunite his life to man, but he can't do it because man has chosen to step away from God. How God reaches man? He decided that his son will become one of us and step onto our ground, come down into our, into our ghetto. He steps into our ghetto and he takes our life upon himself 
And in that life, he conquers sin, he beats sin, he defeats sin. And he steps back over to this side. One human being has defeated sin. One human being has broken the curse. Now he goes back to heaven and he's glorified. So now that he's glorified, what can he do? He's able to take his life and to impart it, to spread it, to pour it into everyone who wants it. You can have life. It's about the natural progression of life. Life from one place to another place, one person to another person. It's losing life and finding life again. That's what it's about. Natural law. It's not a legal thing like say, you broke the law. I'm going to kill you. But if my son agrees to die in your place, I'll kill him instead. And so I don't have to blame you anymore. Legally, it doesn't make sense. This concept developed because we have developed a legal view of the universe. And I'll tell you, there was a time when God did operate through on the basis of legal law. It was during the Old Testament. But the Old Testament was a system that was set up to illustrate the greater system. We should have looked at it and understood the greater lesson. Instead, we took the greater lesson and we made it legal as well. We took the, the legal pattern and we translated it to the real thing. So we are, we, we are still legalists, but only on a bigger scale. And we have made God a legalist too, and we have made Jesus a legalist too. I hope you can understand what I'm trying to say. So, the, in the legal universe, we think it has to do with the legal law. In the natural universe, we understand it has to do with natural law. Laws and consequences. It's like Paul says, how, do, how are we set free from sin, according to Paul? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Two natural laws. The greater one is the law of the spirit of life. In the legal universe, we interact with God through legal law. In the natural universe, we integrate with God as family. I am accepted because I am family, not because I keep the rules. In the legal universe, salvation is through obedience to the legal law. In the natural universe, salvation is by birth into God's family. In the legal universe, there's an extreme focus on legal details. In the natural universe, it's the direction of your life, not the details of your life. You're traveling on this road and you stumble and fall. That does not define who you are. It's where you're headed. It's who is in you. In the legal universe, there's belief in a nitpicking God. I guess you all understand the term. In the natural universe, God accepts us with our faults. All right, now I'm going to say that. And I, I know, I don't know if you, 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 you accept that. But I tell you what, you see the, 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 the prodigal son? When Jesus told that story, what do you think he was trying to teach? Here's a boy. And the boy is a legalist. He says to his father, give me what belongs to me. And he, he has no right because his father is not dead yet. But the father graciously gives him and says, okay. He goes and he, he plays the fool and he spends his father's money in riotous living. Loose women and nightclubs and dancing and gambling. And in no time at all, he has lost everything. And he's starving and he loses his friends and he has to go and feed pigs. And he's so hungry, he's eating the pig food. One day he comes to his senses and he says, but look at me here. And the servants in my father's house are eating like princes and I'm eating hog food. <laughs> now, the boy is a legalist. You know why? He says, I will go to my father and I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven in your sight and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. In his mind, what would make him worthy? If he behaved the right way. But he said, I behave badly. I'm no more fit or worthy to be called your son. Make me a hired servant. He's coming back to ask his father to make him into a servant because he's not fit or qualified to be a son. He does not understand the father's heart. Because every day that he has left home, the father is sitting on the veranda with his telescope at his eyes. He's looking, he's searching the road, he's waiting to see the first sign of that little figure stumbling down the road. And when he sees him coming, the boy starts with his legalistic argument. Father, I have sinned against him. And the father says, he takes off his robe and he throws it around him. He takes off his ring and puts it on his ring and he calls the servant and says, come, kill the fatted calf. 
My son was dead and he's alive again. He doesn't want to hear any argument. <laughs> the son's behavior means nothing to him. Why does he accept him? Is it because he has been good? Absolutely not. Is he going to take him back as a servant? Absolutely not. Why does he belong? He belongs because he's a son. God accepts us on that basis, on that basis alone. He has put the life and the spirit of his son into our hearts. That's why we are accepted. We are accepted in the beloved. Our behavior has nothing to do with our acceptance. And when Jesus told the story, what was he trying to demonstrate? He was trying to show the way God is. Wasn't he? That's the whole point of that story. He's trying to show the kind of person God is. There wasn't any third meaning to it. And if we look at the story and understand it, we will understand that's how our Father is. He accepts us because we are His children. He has put His Spirit in our hearts, not because of our performance. And I'm saying to you, if you're afraid that when I say this, people are going to become careless and live like dogs, they will. But not the Christians. Not the Christians. I don't disgrace my Father. Okay? My father wasn't the best of... Uh, 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 I mean, he had fought like everybody else. I'm not going to disgrace him and disgrace my family name if it is in my power. I'm not going to do it. Why would I disgrace my father when he has given me life? When I love him? When he has saved me? Why would I disgrace him? Why would I go and live like a dog? Furthermore, that's not my nature anymore. My nature has changed. I don't desire those things anymore. Why would I go and do this? Nobody needs to worry. That if you say I'm saved by grace, not by works, nobody needs to worry that we are going to go and live like dogs. The only person who needs to worry is the person who understands external control, legal system, but you don't understand the way of the natural law. So I know you're tired and we have been long at it this evening. And I'm going to stop now. But I just hope that in this final presentation you have got my point. If you have seen and understood, it is enough. Thank you all for your patience. I think that you kept up well even to the last moment. I saw some of you struggle a little bit with a little sleep. That's understandable. It's been a hard day. But thank our Father for keeping us together as brothers and sisters and for giving us what I believe to be truth that will help us to know and love him better. Thank you all very much.